Stanford University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our Stanford Roundtable panelists and our moderator, Charlie Rose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, thank you. This is the closest I will ever get to being on center court of a great NCAA team. So I'm thrilled to be back. Uh, a couple of years ago, when President Hennessy said to me, would you come out? And I came out for a union weekend. Uh, we had a very good time. And then he said at, at that time, in answer to my question, how did I do? He said to me, pretty good for a first time out, but you need to do two in order to fully uh, show your commitment to Stanford University. I said, I'll come back if you give me a great panel. He said, that's a deal. I uh, am pleased to be here because it gives me the opportunity when I am uh, the week before, people know that I'm going to be away for the weekend, and they'll say to me, where are you going? And I will say to them, I'm going to this reunion at Stanford. <laughs> you got it. For a moment, they will look at me like, you went to Stanford? <laughs> I, I let them think it, see, before I say anything. You know. They'll say, but like, Cory Booker went to Stanford, and he's a Rhodes Scholar. That's where they train Rhodes Scholars, and they create founders of great companies like Google. You went to Stanford? They don't really say that, but I know that's what they're thinking. So for a week, I live with the idea that people thinking that I went to Stanford University when the closest I get is to come here and be with you on reunion weekend. But I am thrilled to be, and thank you very much. Let me, let me, uh, we have this extraordinary pa panel, and, and, and a couple of them went to Stanford. Uh, Salman Khan, as you know from the Khan Academy, what a remarkable person he is. Uh, I just realized I'm not doing this in the order that they asked me to. See, there's a notion that you always want to keep them on their toes, all right? So the second is Cory Booker, mayor of New York. Yeah. John Hennessy, who you know, is the, your great president. Uh, then Kim Smith, uh, co-founder, not only of Bellwether Education Partners, but also one of the original founders of Teach for America. And Claude Steele, the new dean of your School of Education. Uh, and you know Reed Hastings from Netflix. What a panel. Uh, we, uh, we're all thrilled to be here. And I begin with the president and ask him, in a sense, of each of the panelists, frame for us uh, the issues for education K through 12. Our title here is Education Nation 2.0 redefining K-12 education before it redefines us. So, Charlie, I think we have a real irony in this country. We have what is it widely admired as the best higher education system in the world. At the same time, we have a K-12 system which is failing far too many of our younger people, especially those in poorer neighborhoods who are simply not getting the education that they need to get the jobs that will enable them to live the American lifestyle. That's what we fundamentally have to fix, and we've got to think about it in new ways. If there's any light on the horizon, for me, it's that more people are aware of this problem and are concerned about this problem. There are more parents that are activated, and that at least gets us on the road to discussing how we fundamentally change the system we have. Kim, define the crisis for us and the opportunity. I think we're at a, a real inflection point for K-12 education, and we have to decide if we're willing to um, let go of our conception of what it used to be and create a whole new way. And I think President Hennessy's right. There's a huge awareness. There's an engagement from communities. We have huge opportunities with charter schools to allow people to express their diversity by having different kinds of schools and by getting uh, management and teachers and kids and parents all working together to create great schools. I know we'll hear from Sal in a moment because I think there's a huge technology opportunity to create um, a much more productive system. We've been doing things the same way for 100 years and using the same assessments and the same systems. So we are at this giant inflection point for the whole system 
and we have to figure out how to get all the puzzle pieces to come together. And so my lens is through education entrepreneurs like Teach for America or Saul or the charter school operators like Aspire. So we can talk more about those. But why I'm excited about the change is these entrepreneurs are showing us a whole new way, and they're just redefining our sense of what is possible. And if we empower them and engage them, then from them, we'll learn how to redesign the whole system. And that's a kind of scary thing. So it takes all of us to figure that out. But, I, but I'm really hopeful. I'm really hopeful. So? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with Kim. I, I think the, um, you know, whenever you, you hear about the whole education debate and everything, it becomes very depressing sometimes. And people talk, you know, the achievement gap and all of this. And, and, and there's a lot of inertia in the system. And how do you kind of move that? And, but uh, I think what's really neat about where we are in history, I think it is an inflection point, is that the gatekeepers are going away. And education, it looks like there are serious gatekeepers there, but I think because of technology and the way society is changing, you see that there's ways to get around the gatekeepers. You're seeing it in the Arab Spring. You're seeing it with um, all of the, the new technologies that came on. You see it with, with things like Khan Academy. And so I, I, even though it might seem very dark right now in terms of a lot of the statistics we hear and all of that, I, I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see some of the most optimistic, um, promising things. And, 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 and really, I, I agree with Kim. I think it will be rethought from the ground up. All of our core assumptions will be rethought, and I think in very positive ways. Reid? Uh, very similar to my co-panelist, technology and charter schools, two big change vectors. Technology is going around the system, through the system, speeding it up, allowing software-based individualized tutoring. It's going to be hugely transformative over the next 20 years. Charter schools, it's nonprofit public schools. It's getting away from elected school boards. The fundamental problem with school districts today are not the people, they're fine people. It's this elected school board model. If our corporations had elected school boards, they would operate as mediocre as most school districts. And the problem is the elected school board. And the solution is getting into nonprofit like Stanford, yeah. You know, great individual operations like Stanford and allow schools to do that. And so public schooling is going to become nonprofit public schooling run by nonprofits uh, called charter schools. That leads a perfect segue to you, Mayor. Uh, well, first of all, just some small uh, additions to my panelists. So first of all, and the President Hennessy and I were talking about this, we actually have a crisis in higher ed in America that is, is of uh, extreme uh, proportion, and we're going to lose our position. Uh, as the education center of the globe on the higher education. The other thing, we're talking K through 12. I promise to come back to higher education. Yes, the other issue is we're talking K through 12. If that's the conversation we're having in America, we're never gonna fix the problem. Pre-K is so critical. Mm -hmm. What happens zero to six, we must start having a conversation about. Yeah. Um, and so from, uh, from zero to, uh, to 18, is to me that the issues are very clear. We are uh, seeing inordinately high crime rates. We're seeing a horribly underperforming GDP in our country. Uh, we're seeing this nation rapidly fall behind in its, uh, amongst its competitor countries. Uh, I, I'm not satisfied that the, the country really realizes the greatest national security threat, bar none, in America is the dumbing down of our population. And, And so in, in, in cities all across America, we, are, we have growing masses of our population uh, that are hitting 18, 19, 20, 21, and have very little opportunities uh, to make a, a living for their families in this economy because they can't plug into a knowledge-based economy. And given that level of crisis, what bothers me is not, uh, and I was talking to some of my panelists beforehand, is not the blockers. And there are a lot of blockers, and there are a lot of very dumb ways that we're organizing education, in my opinion, uh, seeing what pragmatically works, not emotionally, not left to right, but just pragmatically what works. But really the crisis, I think, is the fact that we do not have more outrage and engagement by the population as whole. As, as King said, it's not the vitriolic words and violent actions of the bad people, it's the silence and inaction of the majority of Americans on this problem. then what is it necessary, what is required to stimulate so that they are involved, engaged, and um, in the streets, so to speak? Well, again, it's this idea in America that is so anti-American that if I can just get my family their good education, if I can just get my kids uh, into Stanford, if I, whatever, then we're gonna be okay. But now more than ever, uh, there's a powerful interdependency 
uh, in this country where what's happening to that Latino kid at, uh, at, at Thurgood Marshall High School here in San Francisco, what's happening to that African-American kid at Malcolm X Shabazz in Newark is directly linked to the destiny of your children right now because the majority of the American workforce the majority of the American workforce very soon will be minorities. And the powerful racial achievement gap means that the workers of a few years from now, the whole GDP, the success of our country is gonna be dependent upon a population that's undereducated. And people who do not graduate from high school have dramatically higher rates of imprisonment, have dramatically higher rates of pulling down on social services, have dramatically higher rates of, of, of healthcare needs. Our economy will, will run into the ground. And so this awareness has is, is got to be made. And there are strategies, and this is where Reed and I were talking. I could take you to Newark, New Jersey right now and show you the highest performing schools uh, in, the, in the state of New Jersey because they've just gotten rid of things that are, and, and again, this is a technical term that the dean will know that, uh, that they <coughs> teach at here, Sanford School of Education. They're, they're just doing things that are stupid. And, and, <laughs> and so... And, and so stupid is this. Stupid is running an education system where you still have kids going to school on the same year schedule that we did in the agrarian age. Uh, when we all know that if you want to be successful in this world, you've got to work harder and work longer. And our competitive nations have gotten that. But we still have kids, you know, our, our, our Rahm Emanuel was going crazy when he became mayor. He goes, how can my kids be getting out of school at two o'clock in the afternoon or, or, or at these early hours? So we've got to start doing the things that my successful schools are doing. If you go to school today, Today on a Saturday in Newark, New Jersey, the high-performing schools have mandatory math classes on Saturdays. And they're usually, uh, as you know, in the schools of innovation that are breaking out of the traditional models like often seen in charter schools. All right. Uh, Dean Steele, that brings me to you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether you're part of the establishment or not, uh, <laughs> but you're certainly at the cutting Only edge of looking at where we are and, and where we need to go, taken in the context of what people have said before. Um, what would you add to it? Yeah, I, I would uh, really underscore every, everything people have said. I do think we're at an inflection point, a particular moment. I mean, in my relatively long life, I have never seen as broadly disseminated appreciation of the value of education and how critical it is to the quality of our society. I've never experienced a moment like this. I think it's, I was just saying backstage, I think it's almost as important to me as the fact that Obama was elected as the, as the president. It's a real moment of, uh, of, uh, to appreciate, to, to, to note. I think it comes about from what uh, Corey was just saying, that we recognize our interdependence with communities that we, we haven't always seen as being connected to, that our fate was connected to, to their fate. I, and I think we, we do much more broadly uh, appreciate that. Uh, one thing in this debate that I, I might stress, and maybe this comes from my deanly uh, position, but I, I do think we know a lot about education, and we do a tremendous job of it in a lot of places in this society. So it isn't a completely uh, dark uh, picture. Our higher education system, uh, as President Hennessy said, is, is the best in the world. And I think it's, this is my personal opinion, but I think it's going to take a long time for other societies to, to, to create institutions as powerful as ours are at, at that level. And I also think in a lot of K through 12 schools, we do a good job. We do uh, have a good, there, there are a lot of schools in this area, lots of areas. They, they are unfortunately tend to be in middle class and above. And that's what we're uh, in, a, in an important way concerned about, about here. We want to transfer the skills and knowledge that we have and, and that we use so effectively in those schools to schools in lower income communities, our inner cities, our rural areas that are deprived. And, th and th that I think is the challenge. Uh, as, a, as a dean of a school of education, I think we know a lot. I'm excited by this, uh, what I regard as essentially political movement to open up schools to change. I think that is a, that's what enables this a mo moment. And, and I, as a dean of education, would like to see our, our knowledge creators, producers, join that movement and contribute there, to it. There is clearly a political movement to change education, in your judgment. Yes. I, I definitely believe that. I think of the charter movement, I think of uh, as, a, as, a, as a movement that represents a real change. Uh, so I'll come back and then I'd like for all of you to, to not just wait for my question but respond to what other panelists have said. Uh, it raises the big question that's always at the center of talks about educational reform, which is uh, the teachers' unions. Uh, President Hennessy. Uh, so I think we do have some challenges there, Charlie. If you look at the countries that are leading in terms of how their young people are doing, 
their teacher core largely comes from the top quartile of college graduates. For better or worse in the United States, most of our teachers come from the bottom quartile of college graduates. And why? We're partly to blame for this. We have not made the teaching professional profession a profession. We've not treated like people like professionals. That's what we need to do. We need to treat them as professionals, hold them accountable, expect them to have high standards, evaluate them, but we also need to pay them and treat them as if they're professionals. Yeah. There's also the issue, go ahead, Reed. So, you know, in reform circles, there's often a lot of tension about unions, but fundamentally, unions are not the problem with American education. And the reason I'm so confident of that is the strongest unions in the nation are in New York, New Jersey, um, California, and the weakest unions are the Southern Belt. And if it was true that Mississippi's education system kicked everybody else's ass, you might say, oh, weak union, you know, high productivity, okay? Yeah, yeah. But in fact, the, the northern Massachusetts, the high, high union states do the best in the nation in education. So there's absolutely no correlation. And fundamentally, unions are a symptom of bad management. If you work in a system with bad management, you want protections. And because of the elected school board and the rapid turnover in urban districts, not so much in suburban, but in urban districts, you get a constant flow of new superintendents and relative chaos in management. And because of that, if you're a teacher, you really want civil service protections that unions provide. And so you have to think of unions, it's a symptom of bad management, and the bad management comes from the elected school boards and the rapid turnover. Well, All right. So can I take yes, another pass at the unions? Uh, it isn't the unions per se, it is um, what underlies their collective bargaining agreements, which is something that pervades our system, which is the desire to treat everyone the same, right, which is the way compensation is handled, how many years you've been there, um, and to have sort of one answer, right? So it's the collective bargaining agreements are dysfunctional. To Reed's point, other states just have the same norms, even if it's not because of the union. And that's what I think we have to change, is this cultural belief that the point is for everyone to get the same and to begin to envision a system where we can acknowledge our communities are different, they're very diverse, kids learn differently, teachers like to teach differently. We invested at new schools in a whole portfolio of charter systems. Some are project-based learning, some are, frankly, look like Catholic schools. They're very direct instruction. And each of those can be successful, but they have to be allowed to do things differently. And the management, the governance, the teachers, the kids all have to want to be in that environment. And so it isn't the unions exactly, it's this pervasive culture that you see manifested in collective bargaining agreements, right? But it goes well beyond that to this mistaken belief we should want everyone to do the same thing. We, ha we have to get beyond that and figure out how to have a much more diverse system. All right. but let's stay with this point, uh, the point of management, uh, Mayor Booker. Is it, is it you have a situation in New Jersey which is different. Mayor Bloomberg gained control over you know, the school system. You, the state, as I understand it, in New Jersey has more control than you do. Well, well look, I, I, I see the insanity, and Reed's pointed out, I don't want to belabor the point, which is that you have in b huge cities, you have massive committees uh, that are governing school systems. It's not the optimal way to, to govern a, a school system with these large committees. It, I, I got elected in my city with tens of thousands of votes. Uh, our school board uh, people can get elected with two to 3,000 votes, very low turnout. Often, uh, uh, again, that, that are, people have a lot of different interests and it's hard to make bold, dramatic decisions to move a district in a different way. It's not the optimal way. But I like the dialogue that was going on also, and I really love uh, the points that were made, which, which to me point to a bigger problem we have when it comes to education reform, is that all of us get obsessed with thinking that there's one answer or one solution and often want to just vilify one group. If it wasn't for the unions, if it wasn't for the politicians, if it wasn't for this. And it creates a sort of cognitive laziness where we just hold on to this one idea. And Reed pointed out the hypocrisy of this is that in right to work states and other states, they, they have the same education problems uh, uh, that we have. But at the same time, you also have 
have to say, we all have to take responsibility. It doesn't make sense that on the first day of school, I went to Louise A. Spencer School in Newark, New Jersey, talked to the teacher who had to do layoffs, and unfortunately, the first teachers that they laid off were his two best teachers uh, because they were the last ones hired. Now, now the, first, the last ones hired, and they were the first ones fired. So at, at the end of the day, I'm, what I'm hoping in my city as we take on a bold approach to try to reform education is that I can get everybody out of the blame game and just pointing fingers at individuals. All of us come together constructively to, to, to find a way to deal with this problem. I could not get rid of unions in my police department, but I could sit down with them and say, it makes no sense, um, and I'm going to fight you on this, to have detectives in my gang task force working Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. I don't know what city everybody's from, but the gangs weren't working 9 to 5. So, so you, Gangs don't punch a clock? No, they don't. I wish everybody got off at 5. We could just all relax and go home. Um, so, so at the end of the day, we have to start letting the data drive, the data drive our decisions and, and go simply on what works. In Newark, New Jersey, there are islands of educational excellence that are charter, that are magnet, that are district. And what is the one thing that they all share? And this, that's, that's the problem. There is not one thing that they all share. It's not good teaching, it's not good right. principles, no. it's not technology, it's not socioeconomic No, I mean, the best issue. thing I could say about it is that there's different cultures in those schools that support different practices. And so what I, my philosophy, I have, I have a sense of urgency, is let's give those people who have mastered that creation of culture and those changes the ability to expand. Let's, as a community, stop being damned by low expectations and tolerance and stop tolerating failure and hopefully have those islands of excellence expand to hemispheres of hope and squeeze out what doesn't work and stop being so aligned to All failure. Right. All right, so let's, let's address this idea of a culture that promotes quality education K through 12. Saul? Yeah, no, I, and, and to answer that and to follow up on, I mean, what, one thing that, that we think a lot about it, it, and what we're trying to do is, I, I think what everyone mentioned is, is super important, and I think there's a lot to be said about the charter movement and the culture of schools, but I think way too much of the debate about reforming education is on the educators, the administrators, the politicians, and it's amazing how little you hear about the students themselves in, 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 this, in, in this debate. And, you know, just kind of a point in example, we've, you know, we're starting to experiment, most of our users are random people around the world, but we're starting to experiment how can this be used in a classroom, and we visited high, uh, good charter schools in Oakland where they had eighth graders, and, uh, you know, these, they, they had better results than, their, than the control groups and the public schools and all the rest, but our team visited that classroom, it was an algebra classroom, and we observed, just, you know, you walk in there for 20 minutes, we observed these algebras, they're in an algebra class, they had trouble multiplying. They had trouble dividing decimals. And I don't care what you do to the administrator, I don't care if you have a PhD with the teacher, if you try to teach that student algebra right now, at that point in time, they're not going to learn algebra. So you've Even lost them before? You've lost them before. You've, and and, 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 and what, what we say is, you know, and, and there's an opportunity here, because the, the traditional model is, let's fix, let's fix the amount of time you have to learn something, and you move on, and you kind of move right, lockstep, right. And, and what's variable is how well you learn it. And so that student, I'm sure, just got passed on year after year right. getting C's and D's, but that's a passing grade, and had these huge gaps in their knowledge. And, and when I say what you make fixed is mastery of a subject, and what you make variable is how long you have to learn This it. is really a core problem. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, I think there is a cultural value that great schools share, which is a focus on student achievement to the best of ability of every single student, and that's what they share, whether it's teachers, technology, support for the student outside the classroom, longer school days, particularly for disadvantaged kids who come in starting so far behind. But the end, what's the end result for good schools? They produce students who really excel. Is this an obvious question? How do you measure student achievement? It's not such an obvious question. I think we have become trapped to some extent in the use of standardized testing as the only way to measure student achievement. It's one way. It's like saying we accept students at Stanford just by looking at your SAT scores and the top SAT scores. That doesn't make a great learning community. It doesn't necessarily help us pick the very best students who will go on to do great things with their lives and make the most of their education. We need a more well-rounded way to evaluate our students. I got into Stanford because of a 4.0 and 1,600, 4.0 yards per carry, 1,600 receiving yards. As a, <laughs> as a, um, 
And it worked out okay, Corey. It worked out okay. So I'm, I'm glad that we use data to drive the decision and, and the and for the road, my missions. Um, and the roads committee like that too? They like that, they like that as well. No, the, the, so I, I, I think that nobody is saying that, that, and there's a big obsession with testing right now, but it, it, nobody that I know of, especially in my city, as we look at this, thinking that testing should be the only criteria you use with which to evaluate. It has to be a, a part of a larger picture. But, but we're still doing it. I mean, no child left behind. We're stuck on a model which is only a partial measure of kids' success. Well, so I just want to weigh in on assessments and no child left behind. So the problem with no child left behind, what was great about it is it made us recognize the achievement gap, which is huge, right? We had to admit that, that what looks like a successful school might really be doing a disservice to low-income kids and minority kids. So that was a major achievement. What was bad about it is it continued a culture of compliance where you just check the box and they take the test and you do what it says. And that's the like gear grinding change we're going through in schooling right now where we have to leave behind compliance and move toward performance. And what I would say about assessments, which is sort of what both of you are saying is, the problem isn't the idea of having an assessment if you trust it and you believe it's measuring what you care about. Lots of people take the AP exams and think they're great. It's that we have not invested in great assessments. So we're at this point right now where we want to become more performance oriented. We want to use the data. We just legitimately want to know what works. And we have assessments and a mode of assessment. I mean, how many people in the audience use the number two pencil? All the hands are going to go up, right? We still do that for you know, more than 50 years. So we have to simultaneously invest in much better, richer assessments that technology can let us do to go back to Sal's point about mastery. So my plea would be, let's not have a knee-jerk anti-assessment reaction. Let's say the tests we've been using aren't good enough. Now that we're finally ready to really measure how we're doing so teachers know how they're doing and kids know how they're doing, we got to get some better assessments quickly because we don't, we don't have them. But it's also what Sal, Sal was saying, this is the brilliance, I think, of, Sal, yeah. of what Sal's doing is the best schools that, uh, that use assessments in Newark, they're not for some punitive measure at the end of a right. year. Right. They're actually to help the teacher get better and grow. So at the end of the introduction of a concept, yeah. you can get immediate feedback yeah. on did 90% of the class get this and those 10 that didn't, what's the strategy to help it? Or did only 10% of the class and we've got to change our approach? Well, and which, some of the best schools, my last thing on assessment, like the Denver School of Science and Technology, it's real-time assessments, and not only is the teacher getting that information, but the student is. And that's an incredibly empowering experience for a student to say, oh, that's cool. I mastered those four. I'm struggling on this one. I want to focus on this one. Paul? Uh, an underappreciated oh, point. Yeah. Oh. Oh. No, no, I, I saw you earlier, and I, I didn't have a chance to get to you. So oh, I'm gonna come. yeah. I, I was just going to underscore the importance of culture, too. I didn't want to distract us yeah, from this okay. assessment point, because I know we've moved on uh, a bit now. We I'll can always come back. Well, we, we can always come back to that. But, but one of the more interesting uh, areas of, of research in the literature was a, a number of years ago, uh, somebody going out into low-income communities and finding out what schools worked. What were the characteristics of schools that, that worked? It was called the effective schools literature. So it starts with that, finding a bright spot and then, and then detailing it. And there's a very clear uh, set of, 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 of ideas there. You know, you have to have a, a clear mission. Uh, you have to have high expectations. You have to offer time on task. And you have to have a well-ordered uh, an instruction system, and you have to work for good relationships with, the, with parents and so on. There's a, a pretty clear list uh, of these things. So again, I wouldn't want to lose, leave the idea that school culture is in a, a mysterious zone. I, I think we do have some good uh, strategies for, for how to uh, approach it. It's much like approaching a good uh, a culture in a company or uh, a, a medical practice. I mean, uh, the, these are the general goals that, that, that you have to have, and you try a lot of things to, uh, to, to go at them. They're organizational, it's not specific to school districts, right? right. They're properties right. of a good organization. And so the thing to keep in mind is there's these two reform movements, charter schools and technology. And charter schools are a US specific approach to trying to get the conditions right for good cultures and for cultures to grow, unified mission, all of the sense that we have. Technology is a much more radical view because frankly, we need every kid in Brazil to get a college education. We need every kid in South Africa to get a college education too. It's not US against the world. It's how do we rise the level of education through the world? And the power of technology is to provide that. So, you know, how many generations of teacher development is it going to take in Nigeria to have a great teaching core? Many. 
And technology has the chance to leapfrog that if we can get the right lessons. The second part about technology is individualization. When I was a high school math teacher, my biggest frustration was exactly what Saul referenced. referenced. Some kids knew a ton, some kids were really struggling, and it was very hard to give the right lecture. I always felt inadequate because I couldn't get the level right. The point is, I shouldn't have to do that. Each kid should get the level of instruction appropriate to them as an individual, an individualized tutor. With people, we can't afford that. Right? The last guy to get a great individualized education was Alexander the Great. Right? He had Aristotle as a tutor, <laughs> and, and he conquered the whole Mediterranean basin. Okay? So that's the power of individualization. But now, with software, we can do that one by one. And there's so much work going on to create individualized approach. So the student, the level of instruction adapts to the individual student's level, and they make more progress. And teachers will, we're going to do this revolution in schools where teachers are not going to be lecturing to students. They're going to be helping students go faster, figure out things on an individualized basis. And that's just the very beginning of what the technology revolution is doing, and it's applicable on a global basis. All right, Sal. <laughs> Save the world. There you go. Yes, um, I agree. <laughs> just in case you, I can't imagine you don't know about the Khan Academy, anybody, but, uh, or if you didn't watch the show that he and I did together, or you haven't read how many people have called him such a great teacher. What is it that you have done that has resonated, building on what Reed just said? Uh, what, what makes you as a teacher good? You're making a brown man blush here. It's a... Um, what do you know? <laughs> you know, I, I think it's... it's, it's I, I think it was no accident that it was successful because it was somewhat of an accident. Uh, the, the fact that it was started for uh, my family, that the tone of voice I used in those early videos was for my cousin, that they could tell that you know, it wasn't coming from a publishing committee and a you know, publishing house with a, 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 a committee of people making well, a but script. But just take a step back and yeah, yeah. tell us, because in, in just in oh, yeah. case there's one person don't know yeah, yeah. what you have done, yeah. what you did. Yeah. No, it, you know, it started with me tutoring my cousins uh, uh, remotely. They were in New Orleans. I was in Boston. And then I, uh, I, I started putting the videos on YouTube because I started having 15, 20 cousins around the country that I, I had to scale <laughs> somehow. Uh, and, and, and then they got popular. And they were these little kind of just... And, and their technology, but in many ways, very, very simple technology. I just use technology as a way to reproduce a lot of what you see in an old school lecture, maybe what Aristotle did with Alexander the Great, you know, literally like a, a chalk talk type thing. And, but, but I think what, what people found it appealing, I wasn't the first person to on, put online video. Khan Academy is a team. We're not the first people to think about self-paced learning and all of that. But I think what, what people, res and we might just be at the right point in history where a lot of this stuff is, is ready to be used and, and people understand right, it. Right. But I think what we've res what's resonated with people are that they're very real, they're very human, that uh, people, you know, even though it is, you know, there's like three and a half million students using it every month, they feel a connection with the teacher, they have a level of trust. They don't, you know, I, I got an email from a, a student who said, I mean, it was amazing, he never got higher than a CGP uh, in any math class he ever took, finally went, got, now he's a 4.0 GPA in electrical engineering, and, and what his point was, you know, he liked all these intangibles, but he watched some of those videos 30 times, and, and his point was there's no tutor he could have paid that would not have gotten a little judgmental, <laughs> at, at, you know, by the, by the, by, but, I, but I am infinitely patient. Um, and, and I think those are the things, I mean, you know, we don't know all the right answers, but I think those are the things that are making, it, you know, and, and this is the other very unintuitive thing here. Whenever you think about technology in the classroom, there's a lot of knee-jerk reaction that it's like, oh, we're going to go to this, like, Vulcan reality with, you know, yeah. you know or the Borg or whatever it might be. And, and um, <laughs> what we're seeing in every pilot class we're doing where you have every student working at their own pace, it's making it a more human experience. You don't have a teacher lecturing anymore. Now you have a teacher sitting next to the students. You have the students interacting with each other. They're all going at their own pace. They're all engaged the entire time. And one thing we point out is, you know, there's a lot of debate about the student to teacher ratio. What we think is what, what, what's important is the student to valuable time with the teacher ratio. And that number, old model, teacher has maybe 5, 10% of class time to really connect with students. I mean, I've right. sat in whole classrooms where I've, I've never c had a conversation with the teacher. Right. And now 100% of their time is doing that. So we think it's, it's increasing the humanity in the classroom by, by an order of magnitude. All right. Mm -hmm. Kim, I, reflect on quality teaching. Because it, 
I mean, you were motivated to do it differently. Well, I think it ties back to what Sal was saying, actually, and to technology in a way, because we have such an outmoded sense of what quality teaching is. And, and as Reed said, it's really not fair to teachers to say, you're going to have a group of kids who are um, in quite diverse places, and you have to sort of teach to the middle and struggle through. So my sense of quality teaching for the future is um, someone who's passionate about it, first of all, someone who's inspiring, all the things. I mean, we've all had a great teacher, right? You know what they bring to the, to the endeavor. What I'm hopeful about with technology, as Sal said, is it doesn't make schools teacher-proof, right? I, I think about what you're doing also here in California, rocket ship education is using technology to teach basic skills so that then teachers can teach in the way they're excited to teach around projects and higher order thinking skills. Um, and, and similarly with School of One uh, that was incubated in New York City, essentially a, a playlist. A student arrives and gets a playlist for instruction. They're starting with math. Um, and while it was designed for personalized learning for kids, right, they get what they're ready for, what they learned is that the teachers found the work so much more satisfying because, number one, they were asked to teach the things they teach best, so they enjoyed that, and someone else could teach the other item that they didn't get so well, and the children were arriving to them ready to learn that subject, right? So by personalizing it for the kids, which is our ultimate goal, they made the teaching job more exciting and more rewarding for teachers. And so for me, when I think about quality teaching, it's, it's all tied up in the culture and an exciting and rewarding place to work, compensation that's a job where you can provide for your family. And to get those things, we have to let go of the old way of teaching with your door closed and embrace technology. Because that's the only way we can get there to pay teachers better, to give them more flexibility to innovate. We can't pay any more money into the system, so we have to reconfigure and use technology to let teachers teach better. I think what we haven't, I mean, people really don't get what a, a modern teacher is enduring in, in the yeah. classroom. And so we have teachers, fresh, imagine this, going into a profession where you come fresh out, you jump into a school that does not have a great culture, you're put in a classroom where you're, you're, your principal's too busy filling out all kinds of forms that they're not doing proper teacher evaluation. You have kids coming to you nutritionally unfit to learn, often materially unfit to learn, that have discipline uh, challenges, that have differentiated learning needs, and, you're ex and, and then you're expected- And then you get no tools. You get no tools, no yeah. support and technology, and you're expected to, to, to uh, lift them all up on this certain test, yeah. and if you're not doing that, you're a bad teacher. And so we're not creating, and then you're, as you were saying earlier, your compensation's based upon how many years in school, how many yeah. years you are, yeah. and it's stuck there no matter what you do, no matter how hard you work. Uh, it's stuck there. And so I think we've really suppressed a profession, and people are not going to the teaching profession because it's often not as supportive, inviting, uh, uh, and, and, and satisfying. And then people often cycle out of the teaching profession at rates that are far too high. And if we continue doing this and expect these teachers to play every role imaginable, from parent to nutritionist to disciplinarian, and never really get to the core of, of instruction, uh, then we're never going to elevate the teaching profession where it should be in any thriving democracy, really at the top of our order of priority. Yes, yes. So, Charlie, I, I think this point about technology is a really important one, and I think there are a few things that have changed at the same time to really create a tidal wave effect. First of all, we have a generation that is completely comfortable with online learning, completely comfortable. They just as soon do that as be in a classroom. And in fact, if you go into a large lecture hall now, you see it's not terribly functional. The students are sitting there with their laptops, they have their laptops open, but they're not taking notes. They're on Facebook, they're chatting with friends, they're doing other things. Getting them online in an interactive mode, short snippets, Look at this snippet and now do a quiz, test whether you've really mastered the knowledge. It's a better way to teach young people. And I think it's going to also have to help us address cost. I mean, Corey alluded to the challenge we face in higher education, which is a cost-based challenge. And while the Stanfords of the world are doing fine, you see the struggle that our colleagues at UC Berkeley and the CSUs and the community colleges are going on. And we're gonna destroy this great public education, higher education system we have if we don't fix it. And it's about cost. We've got to figure out how to use technology to improve outcomes and reduce cost at the same time. Technology, a great, a great example of that in, in real practice is a Stanford graduate. It was double E here uh, 15, 20 years ago, John Danner. Um, goes to Oracle, does a startup, makes a lot of money in 99, sells his company. Very smart move then. Um, <laughs> and then instead of going back into technology, he goes and becomes a teacher 
and learns schools. And then he starts a set of schools called rocket ship schools that Kim referred to in San Jose. All technology-based, very driven on technology. All low-income Hispanic area schools, five of them now. And their scores are slightly higher than Palo Alto right now. Okay? So, and, okay. <laughs> and their costs are way less. So they're using technology because he's a fresh thinker, right? He's a guy who's bicultural, okay, who's but, figuring but out that. Tell me what he's doing other than simply using technology. What's happening there that makes his results better than Palo Alto? His culture um, that, he does, that he has evolved is a culture where they don't get, say, bottom quartile teachers. They get teachers who are very aggressive intellectually because they treat them like professionals. So they attract better teachers because of this professional climate. They use technology to do the rote part, to do the constant, you know, you really do have to learn your multiplication tables. You really have to do learn fractions, spelling. And then they use the actual teaching time to be much more intellectual and value-added and creative. So the teachers like it, and the kids respond to it on this individualized basis because they don't feel like they're behind. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible feeling to be in a second grader and you, you're not understanding what's going on. And so they've turned that dynamic, and now they're growing. So they started with just one school, then it got to two schools, now it's five schools, and they've got very big ambitions to be hundreds of schools across America. And we need not just John Danner to do that, we need him to have other companies, and or, or it's a nonprofit, other nonprofits to do the same thing, which is build big networks of charter schools that then share ideas. But, but the thing to remember, one last thing on Rocket Ship yeah. before we move on. Sometimes when people hear the money saving, they have a knee-jerk reaction that we're talking about efficiency rather than quality. And so I just want, last thing about Rocket Ship is, they save half a million dollars a year per school by using computer-based learning for the rote skills with a team leader rather than a teacher, and then they reinvest that in higher teacher salaries and professional development and that culture. So it doesn't, I don't want to leave people with a sense that lower cost means the money leaves. You reinvest it in a way that's right. smarter to make the teaching job better to then grow and have that great culture. Sorry. Claude. Well, I, I, I'm a psychologist, and I don't want to, to miss the opportunity to underscore a general principle here about technology in these contexts. I think a lot of these students struggle with school in part because they feel they're behind. Right. Every, every newspaper tells them they're, they're behind. So you're learning under that kind of a cloud, so to speak. And technology enables you to kind of have this space without that cloud. And so I, I don't think it's, it's a small thing. I think it's a big thing in this problem, a big, a big technique. Well, that solved guy who watched the video 30 yeah. times, and we don't care how many times it takes. It takes him 30, someone else 40, you five, because you can do that without embarrassment and then master the subject and move on. So it is, yeah. you're right, huge implications for yeah. their sense of what they can do. Now, okay. would you guys agree that we're talking a lot about technology. It's not mature yet. No. So we could give a false impression that, um, you know, if you just run back to your school and go to technology, it's going to make all this difference. It's extremely raw today. So why has it been so, technology has been with us and the kind of technology we have has been with us for a while. Why is it so difficult to, to bring it to maturity? Well, th there's a couple things that are helping now, which is the web is the biggest one. So web-based computing makes it much easier for Salcon to develop these lectures and distribute them, not on CD-ROM, but on online. Oh, sure. And the cost of computing, the fact that you can get a $500 touchscreen, that you can get a $300 laptop. So it's just continued progress on bringing the costs of technology down and continue improvement in efficiency of distribution so 20 years ago, Khan couldn't have done what they're doing because the, to just to print all the CD-ROMs and to market those CD-ROMs yeah. would be his entire budget. And now all he has to do is great work, and it's distributed for free via YouTube. Can you imagine a day in which we can go to our computer and watch movies? No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Never going to happen. <laughs> DVD forever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you know, Charlie, I, There's I no money in it. <laughs> another key thing to remember in all this is we've got to think about measuring schools and outcomes in a way. Far too much of school reform has been anecdotal. We think the problem is X. It's class size. It's teacher quality. It's big schools, small schools. It's all. We've got to do experiments. We have to measure schools. We have to figure out why a school performs. The charter school studies have been interesting. If you look at charter schools early on in their life, they struggle. Well, guess what? 
Every new school struggles. You've got a new teacher core, you're developing a culture, you're getting a leadership team, all new schools struggle. If you look at charter schools that get through that infant mortality part and develop over time, that's where you begin to see a difference between charter school performance and non-charter performance. So we've got to be prepared to experiment, and I know parents hate the idea that we're experimenting with their kids, but we are doing it now, we just don't tell them. So <laughs> we need to face up to it, evaluate the experiments, figure out what works, figure out how to make great schools across the entire country. Can uh, I go back to one yeah. thing Corey said before? You talked about it being anecdotal, which is true. I would argue that worse than it being anecdotal, it's been ideological for a long time. Yes. So we've had the left who thought it had to go a certain way and keep people equal and not have choice because some people were leaving, and we had the right who thought it needed to be a certain way and it's all about choice. What I think the, the future has to be, and this is part of what I love about entrepreneurs and part of what I love about leaders like Corey, we have to become non-ideological and very pragmatic, right? And to be pragmatic, we need the data, right? But we just have to be open to whatever's going to work. And if I thought project-based learning was the only way because it worked for my kids, but I go into a school in Newark and realize I can't do that right now. They need computers to get basic skills and then to do projects or whatever. Like, the ideology, I think, is part of what has held us back, even on the front of technology, because there was sort of an ideological belief that technology and education was bad because it would replace teachers. Like, that was really pervasive, and we're just getting past that fear now, slowly, because of a new generation of educators who were just so much more comfortable with technology in their own lives. But mm -hmm. it's not, to Reed's point, we're not going to flip tomorrow into all technology-based. We're just seeing a new openness, finally, I think. I want to come back to court in just a moment, but, but Claude, tell me, What's the evaluation at this moment of the effectiveness of charter schools? Because there's been a bit of sort of, of evidence that they're not always delivering that much better than public schools. Uh, I thought that question might come up, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I did some snooping. And I mean, I, I, I think, uh, you know, there, you, the, the research is hard to evaluate. Right. And, and one, almost every single study has some kind of flaw that, that can that can lead you to disqualify it. Uh, but I, I think uh, the general t conclusion would be that some are extremely effective, some are not very effective at all, and some are uh, completely equivalent with, with public okay, schools. Okay, but what, why, the, why are those that are effective effective, and why are those that are not effective not effective? Uh, there, I, I think there's a very interesting experiment gonna, going on in Houston in that regard that may Ant, give us a, a clearer picture of this. This is done by Roland Fryer, who has abstracted right. from the successful charter schools the five or six principles that he thinks are critical. Longer school days, weekends, longer school years, forms of instruction. And Houston has allowed him to randomly assign some schools to get these five things and other schools to go on as they're going on now. So uh, I, I think that's the kind of research that, that uh, President Hennessy is, re is referring to, that we're going to need to give a, a definitive uh, answer to this a question of... of, of and and, I, and in, a, in a sense, I think the question is, is misguided. I think the significance of charter schools is... Th their greater significance is that they're political. They're opening up the school system so that innovation has a chance, that, that change can can be considered in, in with, without uh, dealing with an awful lot of regulations that have accumulated over a period of time. So you have a greater freedom, and I think that's a really critical feature in a public school system. They, we only have 5% of the schools in the United States are charter schools, right. and they'll never really be the, the complete uh, answer, but it's important for a system to have the capacity to innovate and to explore things. So I think that feature of them makes the, the idea of charters valuable aside from whether you could add how effective they are uh, uh, or not effective. Are public schools better if they have competition? I yes. don't know. <laughs> absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Why I, I mean, does, I why yes. does I, uh, yes. Absolutely. Higher education competition works. Right. Stanford competes against Berkeley. They win in football and they win in other things. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we do, we compete. We compete head to head with Berkeley for the best students, the best faculty. We compete with institutions across the country. I think it makes us all better. It gives us all a so, sense of But not of just public doing. school to public school, but public school to charter school, public yeah. school to nonprofits who are creating different kinds of school yeah. models. It's a good right. thing. Uh, we well. just, I think we just trying to do that. 
No, read. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> when, when you say I need all the help I can get. Not, Thank you, Kim. When you say charter schools will not be the whole solution, yeah. that's like Thomas Watson Jr. saying the world market for computers is three. Okay, which is, it's a time frame reference. So he was right in the short term. And you're all right for this decade. Charter schools are not the whole solution for this decade. But over 30 years, all public schools will need to be run by nonprofits with good governance. And it is the long term solution for governance. So just watch out for being quoted in the short term and long term yeah. so you don't end Co up. Corey, are you prepared to say that? I, I'm prepared to say that, that, that what charter schools have done, and by the way, there's charter schools I love. What, what uh, Dean Steele said is that they run the gamut. I've seen charter schools in my city that are the height of educational excellence. They are cathedrals of learning, and I've seen charter schools that are really, really bad, and that I ask my, my commissioner of education to shut down. But what, uh, what charter schools have done is they've challenged the pernicious uh, 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 bigotry that all children can't learn. And, and so they are creating towering testimonies that we are not doing good enough. And that one, uh, th to systematize great education, we're going to have to find a model that works and can be sustained over long periods of time. And that is sort of the tumultuous cauldron of conflict that's going on. Okay, but what do you think uh, that model will look like? You said we have got to find the model. I think the model in Newark and what we're going for is having a system that is open, where the parents have a choice over numerous models of what's best for their kids. Yeah. And so there are models that, you know, people have been poo-pooing yeah. uh, um, uh, uh, education that's focused on trades and skills. We'll have those choices. There'll be models for high achieving kids that by the time they finish high school, they can get two years of their college education. And so, so how those are governed, it, it, that this sort of portfolio model is to me, it should be governed by, by the schools popping up that are best for their kids' interest. And whether Reed is right, or there is a, some hybrid of that. Uh, at the end of the day, we, can, we cannot be loyal to a distribution mechanism, district school, nonprofit, whatever. We have to be, as a nation, loyal to the results that are produced for our children. So, Simple as that. Yeah, I, 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 I would agree, agree with that. I think the governance theory that Reed is adhering to is one that I'm really excited about because it allows for all this innovation. Whether it's the complete solution forever, I'm not sure. And one of the real problems, I think, at this point is finding enough really good educators to run these charter schools. Uh, it's, it's not as if they're just lined up somewhere. They're, they're, to, to create them, I think that's where schools of education enter the picture, that we need to, to seriously uh, augment the training that we uh, make available for school leaders. That's going to be critical to any of this development. Yeah. And yeah. New Orleans is the great test example of what you're talking about because in New Orleans, the ch uh, charter schools educate about 70% of the children in New Orleans. And it's been an educational renaissance throughout the city. And there's all different, there's KIPP, there's a whole wide range of different charter schools. And not every single charter school is excellent, just like not every college is excellent. But on balance, the city, is, the city of New Orleans has gone from one of the lowest performing urbans 10 years ago in the entire nation to solidly in the middle of the pack and rising. And so New Orleans is the laboratory for urban reform where nearly every child is in a charter school. Well, the two things I want to say to Corey's point about portfolio, and it, and it fits with Reed, is the thing we haven't said about charter schools is a charter is a contract. It is a compact to perform. And it fundamentally turns around your sense of a school's permanence, right? The problem with district schools, because there are district schools that are terrible too, and guess what? They've been around for 30 years, and nothing's happened to them. With a charter, you said you had the state close them down, right? That is the deal with charters. We make an agreement with you as the public that you will do what's best for kids. And if you fail, it is understood that the school will then be closed down. So that's a totally different thing when you look at the spread of them because we can close the bad ones down. And then the last piece around that they give us this opportunity for aligning people and innovation, I'm glad you brought up the leadership point because all these things we're doing are sort of on the small scale and a little bit on the margin, as we've said. So I'm hopeful about them, but, and I don't want to put the blame entirely on schools of ed, and I'm happy to hear what you're saying, Dean Steele, but our schools of ed are broken. We are not preparing teachers or principals or administrators for this new future we're talking about. We had a conference last week for hybrid learning, like Rocketship, to talk about what's working. There's another great example, Carpe Diem. And 
all these folks who are trying this blended model with computer-based and richer instruction are doing it themselves. They have nowhere to go to get teachers and principals who've been prepared for that environment, and that's a shame. We have to fix that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I want to come back to South. I mean, you have a model. I mean, suppose the uh, powers that be in education said, young man, you've done a quite good job, and we appreciate what the Khan Academy has come. Design the model of the future for us in terms of how we educate our children, because when we see in these movies about the lotteries that will enable a parent to put a kid in another school, and the sheer conviction they have that the decision that takes place here will determine my child's life. Right, right. No, so I, I think the first step is some of what we've already talked about, having real differentiation. That's where technology comes into play, where you really master things before moving on. But I think the more systemic thing that really could happen at the policy level is our entire conversation, charter, public, private, whatever, we talk about K through 12 education. Then we talk about college degrees. And implicit in those two words are kind of seat time. 13 years of seat time, then another four years of seat time, or it might be more than four years of seat time, without anyone ever thinking about, well, what have you learned over those 12 years and then those four years? So I'd like to see a reality, and, and some states are experimenting, Oregon's, I think, kind of the leader here, where it's an achievement-based mechanism, where however you learn something, whether it's you know, at the community college, at a four-year institution, on Khan Academy, or from your, from your dad, you can go take an, uh, take an exam, and once you take that exam, no one's going to force you to sit in a year in, in, in that classroom. And I'd, I'd like to see a reality where that happens K through 12 and at the university level. And I think it's actually even more powerful at the university level because everyone is telling, oh, get, go get a degree, go get a degree, and we know there's a trillion dollars in student debt, and, and the return on that debt isn't clear. I mean, if you go to Stanford, you're going to get the return, but if you go to some, some other, you know, there's thousands of universities. and. and <laughs> MIT, you may not. <laughs> MIT. It's valedictorian at MIT. Yeah. Oh, no, well, well, no, no, that wasn't, no, no, no. Oh, I, I won't clarify that. I'll, I'll just let that hang. But the, um, the, the, uh, the, I lost my train of thought. But, but the, you but, what? But, but I, what I would like to see in reality is right now you have, you, we're telling this narrative to students, many of them who are underprivileged students, and go to college. They're taking these loans, they're not working for four years, and then they leave, and their, their job they're getting isn't better than what their dad or mom got with just a high school diploma. And so what I say is decouple the credential from the learning experience. So if I learn on the job how to do network security or if I, or if I learn from Khan Academy, the community college, I can go get a credential. And, and what, what that does is then the cost isn't the cost of a campus. The cost isn't the cost of, of, of professor salary and maybe the research and all that. The cost is the cost of, of the assessment. And it could be a deeper assessment than what we're doing right now in universities. And, and the second level of that is the value of a degree is its signaling mechanism to employers that, hey, this. I'm, I'm employable. And if you have a Stanford degree, that's a super strong signaling mechanism. But you could go to the local community college and you could understand the material as good as a Stanford grad, but, and you got, went into debt for it, but that signaling thing that you got, that credential, is not going to carry the same weight. Yeah. And so if you actually had nationwide or internationally recognized college, you know, you have things like AP exams, you have, why not do it for every class that you have in, in college that anyone can take without having to take an AP exam? And then I, I think you, you start to right. open right. things up. Let me, let me raise one question, I'm going to go to some other issues. Uh, Claude, universities are a place where kids, people come to yeah. learn. They're also research centers. I mean, is the, depart is the education department here a place that is trying to assimilate the best information that you can find to look for where is our future? Is that part of the role that you envision for yes. the department? Uh, I'd, I'd love to see us think about education schools like we think about medical schools or like we think about business schools, that these are areas where uh, there's almost no question that, that research is absolutely critical to good practice. We wouldn't want a doctor who somehow thought he could make decisions on the basis of his gut. We want him to be informed and trained and skilled. And uh, I, I think in the, in the area of education, we need the same kind of relationship to schools, to high quality education schools. I, I agree, there aren't enough. Uh, there, there, we, we do need to extend that capacity as a, as a society. We need to recognize the significance of this enough to extend that kind of capacity. We haven't done that. But we do have some great ones. This is a great one. <laughs> uh, and I, I think we can, this is one of the things, things exciting about uh, being here, uh, is, that, is that it really can model how an education school can position itself 
in this new era, this new moment of reform and the, the kind of political space and, and sort of societal recognition of education that, that, that's happened, I think we need to, th th this is the moment for ed schools to emerge in a sense, because I think they do make this contribution. So Charlie, you know, Kim mentioned this point about ed schools not necessarily serving all our country well, but this is where research can really make a big difference. Right. For example, we know that teachers vary dramatically in quality. The next question is, well, what makes a great teacher versus what makes a not so good teacher? Can we figure out what that underlying mechanisms are? And then can we go out and improve the way we educate teachers so we have more great teachers out there rather than teachers who are not very good? Agree, but to all of you, one, two, three, four, five, six, all of you agree that you probably could define what makes a great teacher? Have we heard that conversation here? I've asked that question. Do you? Reed? Do you think you know what's a great teacher? No, I think it's really student specific. Um, there's a, you, there are um, teachers that connect, uh, teachers connect with various percentages of their students. Great teachers connect and inspire the vast majority. Even quote, not good teachers often connect with a few of their students in a special way. So, you know, and I think that's probably like medicine and, and the relationship with doctors too. So I, I don't, um, I don't think it's, you can, um, it's teaching with humans is very particular to the engagement style and, and it's a unique uh, relationship. Uh, Kim, I, teach I, for, I, yes, Claude. I, I, I think maybe that's not quite the right question because I think there are a lot, um, at least a good number of ways to be a great teacher, just like a great basketball coach or a great CEO. We wouldn't think that there's a single list that you check off and say that one is great and that one isn't great. And because we, we've all had teachers who were great in different, in different ways. Uh, and and I, I think it is a, it's unfortunately a more conditional phenomenon. And, and it depends on, on, on uh, uh, the, the, the students you're teaching, the circumstances under which you're doing it. Some people are tremendous in one circumstance, maybe not so good in another. Kim? I think that's right. <clears throat> I guess I'd say two things. Um, at base, we all, just from common sense, recognize good teaching, and there are some characteristics that all good teachers share, I think, in terms of knowing their subject matter and having the energy to get momentum for their kids and paying attention to where the kids are at. So I do think we know the basic fundamental building blocks. And then I think what Claude and Reed are saying is right, that on top of that, different contexts require different applications. So like what you do online right, 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 versus right. what someone does at KIB versus high tech high, it's different. So what I would say comes from that is, like part of what we learned in starting Teach for America is that what we were sorting out of the teaching profession was an internal locus of control, a sense of leadership, a sense that they could change what was going on around them. We have to make sure that comes back, but then have different paths forward uh, for different contexts. So what has your experience at Teach for America told you about great teachers? That, um, Other than the fact that there are different qualities that are yeah. reactive to different circumstances, that's a given. Great teachers have what uh, Marty Seligman calls learned optimism, and they teach their kids to have that. It has to do with tenacity and this great researcher at Penn um, who calls it grit, right? They know how to bring that out in their students and inspire and motivate, while at the same time being incredibly good at keeping their kids on task and making sure academic progress happens. So that's what I think we learned at TFA. And I think the other thing we learned is when you recruit great people who are passionate, it doesn't take that long to get them to be good teachers. Like, they don't need 10 years. They're not going to be great their first year. They're going to struggle their second year. But they can be great teachers their third year. And we just have to factor that into the way we're bringing people into this and, profession. And how many of your teachers that Teach for America stayed more than two years? 60% of Teach for America alums stay in the profession, and there's 24,000 alums out there. So one is a state um, senator in in Colorado leading school reform. Um, Cami, your superintendent in Newark is a Teach for America alum. I mean, they're everywhere. And they were precisely brought into the profession for their, their smarts, their enthusiasm, their dedication to be leaders, right? Some of whom are leaders in the classroom still, which is great, and some of whom are leaders as superintendents or other positions. I'll come back to John in a second. One thing, go to Corey. It, it is, if, if in fact we could figure out a way to understand the dynamic between student and teacher, that a big if that gets us a long way to creating the kind of educational system that will change America and define the future rather than the system defining us. 
Yes? Yes, I agree with that. And then that's the basis on which we can go back to ed schools. Particularly, remember, most, most of our ed schools are undergraduate four-year programs. People are getting a bachelor's and going out and becoming a teacher. But what happens? They go through that, they take a lot of pedagogy, they take a lot of basic knowledge, and then maybe when they're a junior or a senior, we start to put them in a classroom. That's too late. I mean, that's like saying to a doctor, we're going to educate you for four years of medical school, but it's only in the last year you can ever go into a patient's room and understand what their problems are. We need to move that up. We need to understand how to educate and train them and choose the people that have some of the innate characteristics that will make them great teachers early. Corey, uh, Mark Zuckerberg gave you $100 million. He, he, I, I wish he gave me $100 million. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> Uh, but he, he, didn't, he didn't do that at all. I just thought it made it a more interesting question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, so the Newark, uh, define the grant. Well, first of all, I want to, I mean, this is the, 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 a conversation like this is really critical, but the question should be, what are we as Americans? Is this another time where we are allowing democracy to be a spectator sport? And we're all sitting on the sidelines. Let, let's right, hope they right. figure out education. Um, it will never succeed. And everybody is a philanthropist. And if you can't give of your money, you can give of your spirit, your time, your energy. I am where I am today because the ravishes of poverty and, and something that really hasn't come up that much as a point of conversation. Um, but there are so many challenges that people who are, ha have been stuck in this nation and there are millions of people that have been in generations of poverty, often sometimes young people raising young people who then raise young people. Um, I'm here today because there was a conspiracy of love that wrapped around my father, who was third generation in poverty, um, that helped him get on the right track and get involved. And there's many ways that we all should be getting involved because this problem won't solve itself. And so what I've seen around this country is that some of the people that have been able to stimulate great change in education, and Saul is experiencing this, are these venture philanthropists people who realize that, wait, I do startup companies, I invest, why am I not focusing my philanthropy in, in, in helping to seed innovation and change uh, in the public space? And I see this as I work on prisoner reentry issues, as I work on lowering healthcare costs and getting better healthcare. It is this, the powerful ability of venture philanthropists and social entrepreneurs who come together often working in partnerships. Mark Zuckerberg is one of many uh, of these uh, uh, sort of geniuses that sort of get this, that I can't sit on the sideline in this democracy and hope that government officials figure this out. I'm gonna find ways to seed innovation. And so, you know, he, he took time to research what was going on around the country and found himself in great reverence of the Teach for Americas, the KIPPs, uh, all the different models, but, but his theory was, well, what, let me, if we can find a way to take school systems around the country that are manageable, New York City has 1.1 million school-aged kids, but what about a New Orleans or DC or Newark that have 45,000 school-aged kids? What if we can then take our philanthropy and pull together the best ideas from the country and focus them in one part to really advance the reform, and then now, 10 years from now, everybody's saying, well, wait a minute, maybe New Orleans has a point here, the way they're managing things. Maybe Washington, D.C. has a point, or Newark has a point. So what we're doing with his philanthropy, matching it with other venture philanthropists, uh, matching it with uh, social entrepreneurs, is trying to be a place in America where we're taking all the great ideas that we know are working. Because your other question, I'm glad you didn't get to me about what it takes to be a great teacher. If we ask, let politicians decide what it takes to be a great teacher, uh, we are gonna really stay stuck where we are as a nation. We need to find the, the people that actually know. The most dangerous thing in America is politicians who think they know the answers to everything. Um, <laughs> um, so, so we're looking at a, a very evidence-based model of what is working. We want to bring it to Newark. We want to move the needle and let the light and the hope that we generate in Newark cast away shadows in other places and go viral. The reason I didn't get to you is because Claude told me it was a stupid question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 it's a learning experience to be here. Yeah. Um, so let me talk about the you. venture philanthropist on the on the end there. Uh, <laughs> Can I ask a, yes, please. a question for Saul, which is? When you think about five or 10 years from now, high school math, yeah. 
illustrate for us what that might look like in a Khan Academy school? And then for President yeah. Hennessy, what, what, how can Stanford get departments to collaborate, like between computer science, psychology, and education, mm -hmm. to pull off this kind of vision? So what, yeah. what would it look like in five or 10 yeah. years? No, and actually, there is a little bit of collaboration <laughs> yeah. with Stanford Med School already, and yeah. we can talk about that. But the, uh, <clears throat> you know, what's exciting is, you know, as soon as we start talking about every student learning at their own pace and, and mastering concepts before moving on, it actually blows open everything that we assume about a classroom. Because now, well, if everyone's at their own pace, why do you have to separate them by age group? Now you can have older students, younger students, they can tutor each other, mentor each other, give them responsibilities well before we give them responsibility right now. Uh, why do you have to separate, you know, right now we have one teacher, 20 students, another room, one teacher, 20, 30 students. Why not have two teachers and 40 students, three teachers and 60 students? And they can each play to the, their strengths. And, and we've already started, pot, there's Marlboro Academy, which is a very, I guess, you know, posh, all-girls school in Los Angeles. And we said, oh, we'll do a pilot with you guys if you do something crazy. And what they're doing is seventh grade through 12th grade girls all in one room. Some are officially registered for calculus. Some are officially registered for algebra. But they're all in the same room together, all learning at their own pace, all tutoring each other. And we visited it. It's, it's unbelievable to see the 16-year-old girls be the TAs for the 14-year-old girls who are the TAs for the 13-year-old girls. And you have an amazing math teacher. So I, I imagine a reality five years from now, 10 years from now. And actually, there's no reason to even have math class be separate from physics class, from chemistry class, or from computer science class, because they're, they're all related. And so I imagine a reality where. What about Jim? Jim can be related. Jim, Jim can be very related. Yeah. At least. But you can't do it online. You can't. We're looking at, well, we're, we're, we're thinking about doing something where if you do enough problems, yeah. we can make you do jumping. I'm serious. Like we're yeah. jumping jacks yeah. to get your blood. But the, um, Saul's the, probably the right person to say you can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> I might not have the credibility in Jim. Yeah, well, that's but, true. Um, I'm working I, on that. The, I, uh, but yeah, I imagine a one, essentially almost a reversion to a one room school, but it could be a larger yeah. epic room yeah. right. where kids of all ages are working at their own pace at different subjects. And this is the important thing. You're freeing up time. And I talked to a gentleman who was early, one of the early Facebook founders yesterday. Both him and myself, there's no creativity. Like everything we're talking about, this whole discussion is about you know, 21st century jobs. And right. 21st century jobs are all about creativity. They're not about, can you do an integral? Can you do? Right. Uh, those are important, but there, can, you, can you start with a blank slate and create something that never existed? And now there's no gate gatekeeper. Right. If, if, if you can do it, it'll be used. And uh, what we see is we, you, you have this one room schoolhouse, everyone working at their own pace, and it's freed up time so that if a kid, you know, it's crazy right now if a, if a student, if, if a fifth grader says, you know what, I'm really interested in proteomics. I want to do a month of like deep research in proteomics. We have to say no. You have to go back to the fractions right now. Right. Or if, I, if my son is in school right now and, and I have an opportunity to travel to Europe for a month, and I want to, I'll say, no, we can't take him to Europe right now. He's learning fractions. And the reality is how cool would it be? Everyone's learning at their own pace, year round, continuity. You have a narrative through years. You want to go to Europe? Fine. You can learn on the plane while you're there. And by the way, there might be another school in Europe that you can just show up there. It's, and, 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 uh, and, and, so, oh, yeah. I, love, I yeah, think yeah, yeah, it's yeah. going to change. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think the Khan Academy yeah. has inspired a lot of people to think differently right. about education. We, uh, we had three of our faculty members start an experiment this fall. Um, they put their courses online. They're all online, the quizzes, the homeworks, and everything. Three courses uh, in, in computer science. They have 180,000 students registered worldwide taking these courses, right? Wow. All right. Let so me, it's right. changing. It's changing. And it will change. And I think once this picks up pace, it's like a lot of things. Right. Once it picks up pace, it's going to move very quickly. Uh, I want to come back to the socioeconomic issue and, and the poverty issue. There is a, a growing disparity in income in the United States. Uh, what impact is that having on the education of our young people? Corey? Look, I mean, I mean this is, we're, we're getting, we're afraid to talk about things in this country that are, are things we need to be confronting more head, heads on. We are, we have the tr tragedy of my generation being the first generation in America that could, and I think it's a choice, we can go either way, have the first generation where our children have lower literacy rates than us, uh, a generation where the real income of the middle class in this country is lower uh, than the gen generation before us, and the country that's going to have a greater, the generation that's going to see a greater stratification of income, which really hurts the people at the top, it drags down the whole economy if we don't address this. And the problems that I see on a daily basis of people who are the biggest believers in this democracy, who are earnest Americans, who play hard by the rules, but have uh, 
punishing problems that many people don't even think about. We talk about technology and how kids are uh, easily, this is a generation where kids, oh, they get on computers, they can do things, they're iterative, but the, the large portions of populations in cities don't have access to the internet. They, they're not computer literate, they're not engaged in that way. And, and so I, I sat down with this amazing group of um, early tech companies here the other night. I was blown away, I, I had gotten off the plane, I was jet lagged, they blew the doors off my imagination and mind about what's possible, these tech companies. But one guy was talking about how you're gonna democratize tutoring and talked about the availability of tutors. And, and all I could think about when he was saying this about driving down the cost of tutoring and accessibility, but I was saying my kids in, in Newark don't have access to, to those computers uh, at home to be able to get that kind of information. So we're just not thinking about this as a problem that we're all invested in, and it is undermining the productivity, the GDP, the success, and the dream of our democracy. Nick Reed, how, how, do we, how do we bridge the gap between ideas and action? Well, a, a great example. Entrepreneurship and deliverance of this public-private partnership is um, the Obama administration worked with Comcast as part of an uh, acquisition of NBC, and one of the terms of that agreement was that Comcast would offer $10 unlimited internet to families that qualified for free and reduced lunch in schools. So there was a clear test, and now they've rolled this out through San Jose, and for, say, rocket ship schools, um, their, their families don't have internet at home, and now they do. Okay, because at $10 a month, um, Comcast is doing this. So for Comcast to build some goodwill, um, for the administration, it's a great victory. And for, you know, millions of families are going to be able to access the Internet at high speeds that weren't able to. Now, that's just in the Comcast footprint. I guess in Newark, you're not a Comcast city. So, you well, know... I'm we'll, going to go home and talk to Cablevision. Uh, I think <laughs> you're not going to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm very but serious about that. No, I'm, ten, sure you are. I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so uh, the, the point I want to make is that, that really weighs heavy on my heart is I know what it took for my father to break out of poverty. And it took ordinary Americans who did uh, some extraordinary things. And right now in America, there are single mothers who are working two jobs, sometimes more, can't be there to check their kids' homework. They're blamed, they're blamed for the problems of their kids, but they're struggling in this America. And there are thousands of ki kids right now that these single parents have put on uh, waiting lists for big brothers and big sisters. Right now in America, there are thousands and thousands of kids waiting for people like in this room to be mentors. But people, it only takes four hours a month. In fact, there's now I mentoring where you don't even have to see the kid face to face, but you can, you can now get involved. But yet, we as Americans allow our inability to solve these big problems uh, uh, to, to, to uh, make us uh, unable to do something small towards solving them. The amount of time you spend watching your favorite TV show, and I know the favorite ones out here in California are Jersey Shore, Jersey Licious, and Real Housewives in New Jersey. <laughs> um, <laughs> You give up your favorite TV show for one month and mentor a kid, you can break a cycle of poverty, you can lower criminal rates, you can do that. So, so why aren't we doing that? If, if this is the greatest crisis in our country, like, like World War II, like, like the civil rights movement where people were leaving their hamlets, where people were doing things that are extraordinary, this is gonna kill Ameri the American dream unless more average Americans uh, do those kind of acts of kindness, decency, and love that ultimately are small investments and commitments of their time. So, Charlie, I think this is simple. This is about American values and American ideals. We owe every single child in this country the opportunity to have a great education. And I don't care what their parents do, what race they are, what, how much money they have. We owe every single kid. And that will be the only way we can maintain high-quality jobs and close the income gap is by getting kids educated and prepared to compete in this global economy. I just wanted to stick in that while we're so f focused on the sort of cognitive side of the, of the student, mm. I think we also need to focus on the social development and to recognize that um, extracurricular activities, gym, music, art, a lot of, a lot of kids yeah, uh, excel that way. And, and, they, and they learn some of the critical things that we're finding are really predictive of, of sustained success in life, this grit that, that but, you, were, but, you were talking about. I'm not about. sure you're saying this point, but I mean, it's always been apparent to me, you know, there are certain homes, and, and where do we bridge this gap? There are certain homes in which music and, and culture are all part of the home, a, as well as love. And there are certain places where love is part of the home, but is not as much uh, the, the culture. And how do, we trans how, do we, how do we bridge that gap, too? 
to bring those things that make you fully alive but, as but a... Let me just take a point in this because I see kids that are now, the music programs are being cut. I'm, I'm out there chasing for instruments. I see uh, the cost of even, you know, football was my pathway to places like Stanford. Seeing athletic programs starting to cost more and more money, which are, sque which are further bifurcating our country. Right. And, and to lose the arts in school, it, I mean, to me, that is, it, 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 as far as America is concerned, that is c catastrophic. Okay, let me raise this question at this time because we have only about 10 minutes left. Um, no child left behind in the Bush administration, uh, road to the top in the Obama administration. What is the role of the federal government in the environment we live in today <laughs> when we are at an inflection point uh, in education, John? Well, I think that's an interesting question. You know, traditionally, the federal government has not been involved in K-12 education. It hasn't been their territory. On the other hand, to try to develop a set of programs that would allow states to learn from other parts of the country by promoting experiments, by trying to recognize what works, and helping to share that more broadly, that's a role the federal government could play. I think everybody's a little nervous about having them come in and write the detailed rules for school districts. It's never been the way we've done things in this country, and I don't think it works very well. Uh, but this other global role of trying to figure out best practices and encourage the development of best practices would be a great thing for the country. The role of the federal government should be to invest in technology like they do through NIH, which mm -hmm. has been transformative over the last 50 years in medicine. And if that same approach was invest in a lot of universities, give SalCon 20 good competitors, um, and put uh, that money in the technology. That's the way I expected it to. <laughs> <laughs> then, not, where, not where you thought he was no, going, I was it? I thought it was, you know, give Sal $2 billion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it. As a dean, I would love to see the federal government put a lot more money into scholarships, fellowships for teacher training and, yeah. and uh, okay. leadership training. Yeah. Kim? I think traditionally the federal government's role has been to m provide funding and incentives to make states do the right thing, yes. particularly around civil rights issues, right? Mm -hmm. So we've seen Title I. It hasn't been perfect, but I think we have to count on the federal government to do that because we've seen we can't count on the states to do that. So I would say a combination of investments and in innovation for both technology and preparation, because we have to retool everything. Assessments, which they are doing through Race to the Top, because we have to recreate those. Um, so places like that where uh, a federal investment could allow a number of states to come together like they are with the Common Core Standards to make what comes out of it 40 times better than asking all 50 states mm -hmm. to design their own assessments or their own whatever. That should be the role of the federal government, to create the technologies, the new training programs, the innovation that we don't need all 50 states to go out and reinvent the wheel. And we just have learned we can't count on the states to kind of get together on their own. So I would focus their funding on innovation in the critical areas of assessments, technology, and totally retooling preparation because it's, it's broken. And in, 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 in this question has to do with a sense of urgency and inflection point. Uh, this is an issue that touches so many families. It's the quality of the education because we grew up in this country believing that our children would have a better life than we did. Uh, and because of, of education primarily and opportunity primarily and, and all those other things, hard work and creativity and, and all, all those kinds of things. Um, and if that is the, the reality, what is it necessary today, in a sense, to take us the step forward uh, to make sure that we create that and do not have uh, the K-12 system define who we are and we define what it can be? Uh, start with Sal and, and then we'll close with the <laughs> president. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's really to... I'm asking for a kind of summing up sense of what we need to do today to make sure that we have the urgency uh, and, the, and the goal and that we know the ideas and we make sure they're implemented. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it is uh, to a large degree kind of a, a more instead of, you know, it is this achievement-based and, and, and actually, I'll, I'll take a step further. It, it is to actually even frame the question in the right way. Is that, you know, we've talked about K through 12, we've talked about college degrees. Those aren't the ends, those are means to an end. And the real end is a productive, happy life. And I think I would love the conversation to be, how do we get more people to have a productive, happy, I think it's Bhutan that has the National Happiness Index or something right, right. like that, <laughs> uh, which actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and so I think when you, frame, when you frame the question that way, it puts a lot more into play of like, well, 
maybe there are alternates to a college degree. Maybe there are alternates to a high school degree. Maybe the way to solve the dropout problem, instead of forcing a student to stay in a seat for 13 years, maybe you say, hey, if you achieve these goals by the time you're 12, you can leave. You can go do something. <laughs> um, I, I, think, yeah. I, think, I think it's all about, about framing the, the, the discussion that way. No, I'm coming to John last. Oh, Mayor. sorry. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I just want to sort of uh, do what politicians often do, not answer your question directly. And, and, uh, um, I, look, if this is going to be the last time I'm speaking, I'm just... Yeah, but before you do that, I want to tell one quick story about him. So I, and one more of my sense of commitment to Stanford. He and I were at a, an event in New York, uh, and his father was in the audience. And I said to his father, um, let me just get this straight. You know, you, through love and happiness and, and encouragement and being a great parent, you created this son who, and you and your his lovely mother, created a kid that went to Stanford, got this fine education, then went to Oxford, got this fine education as a Rhodes Scholar, and then went to Yale Law School. And Brinks, I mean, and companies were backing the truck up to his door saying, we just want you to go do whatever we do, and you will be a happy man. And he ended up um, in a tent in Newark. <laughs> because, because he thought that was a place that he could stand to make change. Well, he was fighting injustice. And his dad, and his dad said to me, it couldn't have been better. Mm -hmm. oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Just for my final comment, I, I, we, we see so many panels at, at, uh, in, in, a, in a settings like this, reunions on TV, TED Talks and the like, and I just really hope that people realize that change will never happen um, by watching it. it. It only will happen by participating in it. And if we all left here today and said, I'm going to take one action differently than I didn't, that I didn't do last year, um, I can be a part of this. Because to me, the crisis in America is so underestimated right now. Uh, and Langston Hughes said it best in the South Land. He said, there's a dream in this land with its back against the wall. To save the dream for one, we must save it for all. We must make this democracy available for everyone. Kim. <clears throat> well, first of all, I'll say it's never fair to ask someone to follow Corey, so that's not fair. Um, I would say a couple things. All the sort of tactical, strategic things we've already put on the table, I just want to check those boxes again and then say um, much of the work I do is leadership development. And because we are trying to completely recreate a system and reimagine the system and create the technology for it and recreate schooling and get beyond schooling, the people. We are doing a dismal job of investing in the people. Like, as Reed said, we can't grow these great charter systems because we don't have the people to do it. So I would say to all of us, Think about doing this work, and to those who are philanthropists, think about supporting the people who are doing this work, the leaders we need to create this next generation, because we, we can't get there without, you know, 100x of the people who are sitting here on the stage, the Corys and the Sal's of the world. So in addition to the technology and reimagining and mastery, all those things, I would just make sure we come back around to remember However we conceive of it, including using technology, education is fundamentally a human endeavor and always will be. And we have to get more great, amazing, inspiring people to step up and join this struggle. And now. Yeah. Yes. And no, now. exactly. Yeah. Go ahead, Reed. I'm enormously optimistic because there's more change and more broad thinking than there's ever been in education reform. Education's been perceived to be in crisis in this country about every 10 or 20 years since its beginning. In 1910, 100 years ago, college presidents, Ivy League presidents all got together to figure out how to solve the disaster of the American public school system 100 years ago. We saw it after Sputnik in 1957. We saw it in A Nation at Risk with Ronald Reagan. But every time the problem has been they're tinkering with the system, 2% better here, 2% worse there. This is the first generation that both through the political change vehicle on charter schools and the technology change vehicle that are talking about radical new ways that are going to transform society and make us deliver on the promise of every kid, not just in America, but around the world, getting an incredible education. And 50 years from now, it's going to be an incredible world. Claude. <laughs>
this is the point where we start getting repetitive, I think. <laughs> uh, but, but I do think we're at this moment, and I do think it's unique, certainly in my lifetime, of people appreciating the, uh, our interdependence with everybody in society. I, I think Corey said this. I've been with him over the last two days. You said this beautifully a number of, of times. There's some recognition that, that we're all together and that, and that we're going to share fates and that education is something that, that we need to do to have a, a, a better society. So I, I think that... The, the main impulse is to join this movement uh, from where you are uh, and to make fine ways from, from where you live to make the kind of contributions you can make. Uh, from mine, I really feel uh, that uh, improving the profession of teaching and school leadership is just absolutely essential. Uh, and I also feel uh, of equal importance is an emphasis on continued commitment to innovation and, de and development of, of, of ideas about how to do these things better. President Hennessy. So, Charlie, I think if you look at the founders of this country, they recognize the importance of education to our democracy and the thriving of our doc democracy. Benjamin Franklin started a university. Thomas Jefferson started a university. They understood how critical it was. In this global competition we find ourselves in now, it has become more acute. We need to make sure that we're giving young people an education that prepares them to lead a happy and productive life, as Saul said, and getting the very best minds around the problem. I agree with Reed. It's a time to be optimistic, but we're going to have to continue to attract the best talent. After all, there's nothing more rewarding than working with a young person and seeing them accomplish something great. And I think that's why so many of us have come to a university, because you see that every single day, and that's what gives me an optimistic view for the future. I want to, at this point, thank all of these uh, panelists for coming here at this great weekend. And, and um, one point I wanted to make was the um, immigration issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and most of all, most of all, look around this room and, and reiterate one point that, that Corey and others have spoken to. Uh, it is most great things have come from the grass up. They come from the intensity and the involvement of people like you. You're here because uh, of a connection to a great university and because of your own aspiration for your children, uh, but you're here also because, you know, you believe in the future. So uh, this is a, one last note to sum up what we're saying. Uh, there's remarkable talent uh, in this building, uh, on this stage, and in this country, in every neighborhood. Uh, that can, if they are with the, I think, requisite connection to uh, the levers of doing things, uh, make a difference. Thank you for coming this morning, and we look forward to seeing you another time. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.